But I want to get very deep into the uh, into a series called the mystery of tongues. It's probably going to be five, six parts. I think um, you know thereafter. I want to get into the new covenant. What the new covenant means. A series thereafter. It's things. For example, last year what we were preaching on is a kainos. So with me, kainos. Kainos creation, meaning that the sons of God series. And where there is, uh, you know, a lot of the church never tapped into the, um, the uh, you know, they're still living under an old covenant or they are in the new covenant with old covenant um, clauses, with old covenant uh, conditions. So they live the new covenant with the old covenant conditions. For example, they'll say to you, no, 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 but you know, in 1 Corinthians 5 or 2 Corinthians 5, somewhere there, it says the drunkard shall not enter and inherit the kingdom of heaven and this and that. And you know, if you're a drunkard, okay, what is a drunkard? If you're drinking of this and if you're, you know, well, in Revelation 21, it says uh, unbelief or 18, 19, 20 around there it says even the unbelieving shall burn in the lake of fire so that believes does that mean if any of you have unbelief that you'll burn in the lake of fire so the bible is not read in context because we read it without the filters of the new covenants whenever i read scripture i read it with three filters the a filter of a new covenant the filter of grace and the filter of fatherhood sonship theology are you guys with me and I'm glad, listen, while we're on live stream for all the preachers that are watching, I'm glad you take our messages, our prophecies, and you preach it. It's great. At least the word is getting out. Like Paul would say, some would do it for envy, some would do it for jealousy, some would do it for lust. But at least the gospel is being preached. Why am I saying this? Because one week I'm preaching something, the next week I see four others preaching it. But uh, twisting the scripture and, and really the, not getting the same substance or importation uh, that I got, or even while we prophesying, I would prophesy over an individual and I would use a certain vocabulary. And then I would see others a week or two afterwards prophesy over individuals using the exact same vocabulary. Exact same. Now, to you might seem like, ah, I'm just being over. No, 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 unfortunately that is the reality because you see, the, even the Bible says in, I think it is in Jeremiah, tell the prophets to stop stealing prophecies. So God even warned and gave a judgment to those prophets who were stealing prophetic words. Are you guys with me? I prophesied six months ago to a year ago. Those of you that were watching our live streams or were in the services, I prophesied, I said, pray against two flags becoming one. Then I said to you, pray that, 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 um, pray that your yeah, two flags don't become one. Then I said, the party that you don't like right now that is in power is the best that South Africa has. I said, it doesn't make sense, but it is, the, it is right now. And then I said, nothing is going to happen this election. I said, but the wheels will start turning. And you must pray against a person called Zuma, whether it is him or his predecessor. Okay, I made it very clear a year ago. So if people start saying now that I'm copying prophecy because some prophets are prophesying it, please. I said prophesied this a year ago. Um, the small time prophets that are prophesying it, they might get it from us. Uh, those who are really big prophets who are prophesying it, they might be hearing from the Spirit. Uh, I doubt that they would come into, into my stuff and hear. They, they do, and I know them personally and they do hear from the Spirit. So, so um, uh, and that is what I stood by, that is what I stand by. There will be things that is going to happen during elections. Um, I saw... When is elections? 29th of May. I doubt it. But anyway, um, so, so, so um, I'm just saying, I'm doubted. I'm not saying God says, okay, so, so um, uh, there's going to be some disturbances on the streets. There's going to be riots. There's going to be fires. Um, there's going to be... Uh, there is going to be stuff that is going to come out, but the decision has already been made, and uh, ANC will stay in power. 
but it doesn't mean ANC will keep their power and it doesn't mean that God has already left that one. God has left that one. When the Bible says that God removed the kingdom from Saul, he still reigned for 40 years afterwards. Are you guys with me? Now, I'm not white, I'm not black, I'm non-partisan. I'm telling you right now, I prayed a prayer two weeks ago. I asked the Lord, I said, who are you with? What party do you approve of? Who are you with? I know who you're with in America. I know who's your president in America. But who's your person in South Africa? And the Lord said to me, no one. He said, no one. So however you want to interpret it for all the Christian parties that want to get upset, God bless them. There's at least more than one now. Okay, so the one can't think. I'm just speaking to them now. Uh, but the Lord said to me, with no one. He is with no one. He said many have their own agenda. Many smaller independent ones have their own agendas. Uh, many sp smaller Christian parties, smaller Christian parties, has their own agenda. And it is, it is not of my spirit. And uh, it will not prevail. But pray that two flags don't become one. Pray that two people don't become a convergence of one. Two that used to be together. So, so pray against that. That's what the church needs to pray for. There is, um, God's hand is not on this nation. I'm not a prophet of doom. Please, I'm saying the nation, you're from the kingdom of God. It's different. Okay. But God's hand is not on this nation. Uh, because of things that has been done. Uh, and I know people are going with their shofars and everything to the parliament and shout and scream. And that's Old Testament stuff. Get rid of your ark that you carry and your shofar. And God is not in that. It's Old Covenant. Don't get upset with me now. Are you guys upset? You are very upset because I'm touching your golden cow now. He, Jesus said, me and my Father will make our permanent abode in you. Not in a shofar. In a shofar to open the heavens. The heavens are open. All I'm saying is that somebody once started coming here with a symbol and I think we, we carried them out with a symbol. Okay. And every church they go to, they come with their symbol or their shofar. No, it doesn't work like that. You, are, you have a religious spirit. Get over your religiosity. Get out of the old covenant. Is this a four beautiful? I'm sure it is. Is it, is it, do I have one? I don't have one. Uh, do, I, do we anoint people with a ram's horn? Yes, we do. Do we, um, but it's got, it's not going to bring God into a place. Okay. Um, it's old covenant. We have been written and given a new covenant. A new covenant means a new contract, a new agreement. The old agreement no longer exists, has no longer any trace. You are in a new agreement. The problem is Christians are starting the old agreement without understanding the new agreement. The old agreement, the old covenant was a type and a shadow. The new covenant is the substance. Are you guys with me? So there has been a new covenant made. That new covenant is that me and my father will make our permanent abode, our house in you. Meaning God is not in the heavens now. He is in you now. That is why the Bible says eternity abides in every man. I know it is a very difficult concept to understand because we believe the Holy Spirit is in us. But if you believe that God made His permanent house in you, it is something different. He no longer lives in temples built by human hands, but He lives in temples built by the house, by the hands of God. Meaning He lives in you, breathes in you, moves in you. That wherever you go, God goes. Wherever you speak, God speaks. Wherever you move, God moves. That God lives and has decided to permanently live in you. Now that will mess up eschatology on an all another level. That's why I decided not to teach it right now. I'll wait till, till, uh, till one day. Um, because that will mess up people's little things they created in eschatology. 
even the return of Jesus Christ. Yes, He is returning. But um, uh, not the way that we think He is. Yes, He is returning. Yes, I can even debate that He's returning in a bodily form. But mm, let me just stick it there. There are many comings of Christ already. Many comings. This is not the second coming that is coming. This is probably, the, according to Scripture, I think the third or fourth coming. Just what we can plainly see. Are you guys with me? So, so, but I want us to get onto something. So the Lord said to me this year, and I, and I announced at the beginning of this year, this year just went by quite quickly, but I'm going to put a real emphasis on it, is, to, is the, the emphasis on prayer. And prayer cannot be taught without the ability to pray in other tongues. Many people's lives are messed up because they can't even remember when last they prayed in tongues except maybe for a Sunday meeting in worship or in a prayer meeting, if they do come to a prayer meeting. But they cannot remember when they were given tongues. So I'm going to start off a series. It's going to be a teaching. I want you to stay with me. Um, if you have pens and books, you can write just the scripture references or so. Uh, try not to follow in the Bible. Just look on the screens. It's going to be a lot of verses. I want to lay a foundation as to what tongues is and why it was given to us. This is very important. And how it fits in with the new covenant and why it is so important. Because you will see how the people in the old covenant could not live without something. And in the same way in the new covenant, in the old covenant, in the new covenant, we also cannot live without something. And when we don't have that something, we die spiritually. We become unhealthy. We become, on, we, we lose the fire of God. We become bitter. We backslide. We do all, caught, we are caught up with all sorts of nonsense. Offense comes in, delays our destinies. Offense comes in, delays our futures. Do you know how many Christians I have seen offended? I can already predict with many around me. I can say 10% uh, uh, of you will make it. The others will not because offense will take you out. Why? You have not prepared your heart. And your heart could only be prepared in a certain way. Your heart could only be prepared. You see, the heart is wicked, deceitful, evil above all else. So we have been given a new heart, the Bible says. But this new heart we have been given is the Spirit. Are you guys with me? It is a spiritual heart. It is a heart of flesh. It is Spirit. So, so many Christians are not in the spirit and they are not spiritual, they are carnal. They still love Egypt. Egypt is still in them. Bondage is still in them. They are not doing what they should be doing to break away from that bondage. So what happens is it lures them back and there's a monster that is about to come out sooner or later. All you need around you is a spiritual Christian that will press buttons that you will hate, but if you have a good character or a good heart at least, you will realize that this is the test of God and how to respond to it. You don't need somebody buttering your ears and flattering you. It is going to lead you to destruction. You need somebody that can tell you the truth. Because if the devil is going to take you out, he's going to take you out by offense. If there, are, if there is a hundred people here called to ministry, I can guarantee you 95% of 95 of you will be taken out by offense. I'm serious. There are casualties in ministries and what happens is there's bitterness, there's hurt, there's offense that comes in. Offense is the only weapon that the enemy has against you. He has no power against you any otherwise. Curses don't work. Curses only work if you don't believe in the finished work of the cross. But offense 
will make you fall short of the grace of God, which has a total different meaning, meaning that you fall back into the law and you condemn yourself. And because you condemn yourself, you're guilty. Are you guys with me? So many has delayed destinies, has destroyed themselves. Do you know how sore it is or painful it is for a pastor to leave, for people to leave? So for example, we have, uh, we, we, we have someone that, uh, and let me just say this, uh, Krugersdorp has to watch out for. Too many people are whispering to you. I don't care if they are a leader. I don't care if they are a pastor. I don't care if they are a HOD. If they whisper to you, you must see that this is one that the devil has entered and is using. Because you will be taken out by that whisper. The Bible says the war of words. Do you think everybody sitting here is saying, you're going to be kidding me, you're so full of sin. That's why you're sitting here. I, 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 I. But you need, to, you need to get to a place where the heart becomes pure. The heart can only become pure by the Spirit, which is praying in tongues. And I can guarantee you who has a prayer life and who doesn't have a prayer life. Now people create prayer lives by their own idolatry and they create God's voice by their own idolatry. So offense becomes God's voice to them. Are you guys with me? You can have a family sitting on the first row or the second row. And they're sitting there faithfully for three or four years. And just because they disagree with one thing, they'll pack up and leave. And all of a sudden they'll say, the Lord has told us to leave. No, the Lord hasn't told you squat. You have offense. And guess what? There'll be no blessing for you. It's not a law thing. It's a principle thing. Because you haven't taken offense against us. You have taken offense against Christ. This is His church. I have without exception, I have not seen somebody leave the church in a bad way without their lives being messed up. Got messed up. I'm saying in a bad way. Is that okay? A good way is, at least if you have taken offense, say come, you have taken offense, come and repent, but say that you, don't, you feel it would be better for you and your destiny to go be maybe by somewhere else. That is being honest. That is being, having integrity. Integrity, a lack of integrity is you just huff and puff because of your pride and you refuse to see anybody and you send an email. And these are mature people, 50 years, 60 years old, Offense has already kept you for 40 years away from your destiny. Now you wanted to keep the, you the rest of your life. I don't beg people to stay in the Canaan or in their promised land. It is up to them. But it does break a pastor's heart because I've learned not to become sensitive to it. Um, when I read an email and I see and, I, and it says, the Lord has spoke, I already close it. Because you see, you have created another voice call, and you called it the Lord. The Bible says, the voice of the Lord is in the midst of your leaders. Not in your imagination. Paul, a man who visited heaven, wrote two thirds of the New Testament sat in the church and would not leave until the Holy Spirit spoke to the leaders and the leaders called for Paul and sent them he didn't go to the leaders and say you know the Holy Spirit spoke to me no 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 people today are full of themselves that is why the church is a mess that is why this transfer growth 
Everybody blame us and say we take people from other churches. No, it's people that are offended that is coming in, people are offending you that is going somewhere else. And that is how the church is growing. So are we really winning the lost? Or are we just getting people from other churches and people that are tired of another church coming here? Or are you really geared and trained to win the lost? Are you guys with me? So let's get into tongues. Say with me tongues. I doubt it. I'm going to finish. If I don't finish, it doesn't matter. Then I go on, then I go on next week. So it says, uh, listen, first of all, before a country is colonized, they change the language of that country. Okay, very important. Before a country is colonized, they change the language. So what is God doing? God is colonizing this earth by His kingdom. What is He doing? He's changing a language. Are you guys with me? Language is very important. Language speaks of the heart. So when I speak natural language, I speak out of my natural heart. When I speak spiritual language, I speak out of my spiritual heart. I always listen how people talk. You see, people can put a beautiful face on until you open up their WhatsApps. I'm serious. They are wicked. They pretenders, snakes, deceptive, vipers. They pretend in front of you and you open up their WhatsApp. Guess what? If you this, if you that, you be the year, this, that. I promise you. Christians that are your leaders talk like that to one another you are a child in a nappy because your language is exposing the wickedness of your heart you see because salvation is found in your mouth the Bible says believe in your heart but confess with your mouth unto salvation so I listen to the words of someone's mouth when I want to hear whether they are truly saved or not. I listen to how they talk. I listen to what comes out of their mouth. Because what comes out of their mouth tells me what their heart is full of. Are you guys with me? So, so the heart can become very deceptive. Are you guys with me? The heart can become very deceptive. The language... So God has decided as we got into the new covenant, let me give a new language. The new covenant had to come with a new language because the old covenant is going away. An old covenant operated by a language called the law. The new covenant is operated by a language called the Spirit. Are you guys with me? So with the Spirit. So people don't understand the new covenant. The new covenant is the new covenant is something that we do not deserve and we will be doing a series on it because it is too big it is speaking of new creation realities who you really are and we live as if we are under the old covenant you are no longer under the old covenant the old covenant was a covenant of law and works. The new covenant is a covenant of grace and receiving, accepting who we are. That we have been taken into a household like Mephibosheth that was crippled, running. And David says, just because you are an heir or a family of soul, I will take you in and you'll sit by the king's table. You don't deserve it, nothing. No, but why? Because you have blood flowing through your veins that comes from Saul. Are you guys with me? And so it is with a new covenant. Because there is something about you. You are a son of God. You are taken into a house and being sat at a table that you don't deserve. People don't live right because they don't believe right. Wrong doctrine has been preached to them, so they live wrong and they live in poverty. Let me tell you, the curse of the law is poverty, death, and sickness. So where there is poverty, there is law. 
Where there is sickness, there is law. Where there is death, there is law. Condemnation kills a person. So where somebody's finances isn't doing right, it tells you there's an area of condemnation there. So if you can understand the concept of grace and the new covenant, right believing, so if you're right believing, is right living. So I'm not going to get through the whole message, but I'm going to give you the gist of it, of tongues as to why it is important. You see, we can, all, we can know the principles of faith on how to rebuke and all these things. But that is the old covenant. Please understand me. Because what do we get onto now? We get into our houses. Or we get into somebody's house or we deal with something. And guess what? What are we doing? We begin to rebuke. I rebuke this situation coming against me. I rebuke. But what is that? Most of the time, it is from a position of fear. Secondly, most of the time, it is a position of hope. Thirdly, yes, we can come into a position of faith. But faith is still old covenant. Because Jesus said to the centurion, such great faith have I not seen. Are you guys with me? Where was Jesus living? He was in the old covenant. The new covenant only was after his resurrection. Are you guys with me? So when the new covenant come in, we see something peculiar being poured out called grace. A lot of us live by faith and not by grace. What is faith? Declare what I should have. Grace is receiving what I should have. So that is why we say by grace, through faith are we saved. By grace, through faith. So if it by grace, through faith, are we saved. So when I speak in tongues, now listen to this. Let's go to Mark 16 and 7. I'm not going to get the whole message through to you for the sake of time and for just the sake of context, I think. I want to give us the Holy Spirit lead. It's just an introduction to the series. You know, when you have time to pray in tongues, you don't have time to gossip. When you pray, you can't talk about others. You pray. Paul said this, he said, I thank my God, I pray more than you all. You know, there's times where I'll sit the whole day and I'll just pray under my breath and tongues. I don't have to scream and shout. There's not a God in heaven somewhere that's going to hear me. He's inside of me. So I pray. What do I doing? I edify myself, but I'll get to that later. But I pray and I pray and I pray and I pray and I pray in tongues. And I realized when I didn't, and there was a season when I didn't, an unbelief entered into my life. Where I had to get somebody to pray for me for unbelief to be broken. And I realized this because my eyes were watching stuff that was negative, not positive. And I was listening to stuff, preachers, that was negative, not positive preachers that had the ministry of condemnation on their tongue, not the ministry of grace. So as I'm saying, KDP has to be very careful. The spirit that wants to come in here all the time is you want to open up your ears to gossip, or it is gossip. So what have I come to do? I've just come to slay serpents and vipers. For the last few weeks, and I'll still carry on. Because God has given me a watchful eye as a parent over the house to see what is going on. Just as you know what's going on with your children, I know what is going on with the church. I know when people open their ears, I know how many people have been destroyed by opening up their ears. I don't care what status you are. I don't care. I don't care what 
you have, what money you have. I don't care what position you have. If you destroy or touch the church, I don't care how high you think of yourself. If you destroy or touch the church. Listen, I've had people sending me messages where they said they will kill me. They'll destroy the church. Sitting in the church. In the church. Are you guys with me? Possibly sitting next to you right now. Sometimes I'll be in prayer and I'll hear things and I'll be like, God, no, don't let it be true. But then I realized it's the church is sitting with messed up people. It is just that there's a time when we grow up is what Paul said to the Corinthian church. He said, you're no longer on milk. You're on meat. You're supposed to be on meat. You're supposed to be teachers already. Why are you opening up your ears? Are you guys with me? Let's go to Mark 16 verse 17. So tongues will replace gossip. Tongues will do a lot of things for you. A lot of things. Don't think tongues is just a noise. Let me explain to you how important tongues is. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. So they will cast out demons. This is the first sign that you actually believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That you can cast out a devil. Some people run away from deliverances. Can you cast out a devil? Because that's a sign that you believe. And the second sign that you believe, they will speak with new tongues. Say with me, new tongues. The word new tongues is unprecedented. It means never existed before. It is the same word as kainos. And you know what kainos means? Superpowers from another world. Not, never existed before. Never something coming like this after again. Meaning a lot of people would say that tongues were spoken in, in Eden, in the Garden of Eden. No, they didn't speak in tongues there because the word new means it never existed before. Are you guys with me? It come, came only after Jesus rose from the dead. Only afterwards. So the Holy Spirit manufactured a language that He placed inside of you. He manufactured a special language inside of you. This language is designed for you to pray everything that you cannot put words to. It is there to intercede. It is there to pray for your future. It is there to pray for everything that you've always wanted. Listen to me. Nothing in my life has come without a fight. You know, um, I had Apostle Neville um, speaking to the team the one day and he said to them, he said to them, you know, I've observed Leon for let's say 16 or 17 years. And uh, the one thing that just, just hurts me or, 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 or boggles me, he said, nothing comes without a fight. He said, one door opens and it is like everybody want to kill or shut and he says, same thing and same thing and same thing's over. And whenever God promoted, it is like they wanted to kill him. He said, he's never seen it with, with somebody else. So in my life, never, something has never come without a fight. Um, I think that is why I value certain things that I have. And, uh, and um, you know, I can be a very kind and friendly person up until a point. Up until a point. I can, be, I can carry so much grace. I'm telling you, so much grace. But then just one day I'll just wake up and I'll just find an axe. <laughs> I don't know why I'm not thinking about it. Nothing. And it's just done. Goodbye. Um, but I'll have a lot of grace and a lot of mercy. But that is when my kindness have been taken for stupidity and weakness. So the Holy Spirit has designed the language to give to us, and He has given that language to us. Tongues will bring you out of deception. There are many here that are in deception. You have been deceived because you're sitting under spirit in this region. And uh, there is a spirit in this region that has deceived many. 
um, but you can come out of it and there is a way that you can come out of it it is by praying in other tongues Daniel could pray not in other tongues yet to pray in a natural language that is why that is why the prince of Persia heard him and heard his prayers and could stop the angel Gabriel coming to him he goes with me but now when you have a new tongue it is something the devil doesn't understand Paul says, I thank my God I pray in tongues more than you all. That means every single day he prayed. Praying in tongues doesn't mean you have to stomp up and down. and tarabashaka. It just means wherever you are, you just pray. Your spirit is praying. Wherever you are, you're just praying. It is the gateway to power that I'll get in on in the next parts. It is the gateway to many other gifts. How much do you pray in tongues? It is not a law thing and I'll explain now why. How much do you pray in tongues? Let's go to Romans 8 verse 26. Romans 8 verse 26. It says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our infirmities. Say with me, infirmities. Isn't it amazing? The one translation says weaknesses, which is wrongly translated. But here it says in the King James, the original, which is the more accurate language, it says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities 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 is sicknesses are you guys with me that means the more you pray in tongues the more healthier your body becomes the more you pray in tongues the more divine health you're walking in for we do not know what we should be pray for as we ought but the spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered So the Holy Spirit wants to help you. He wants to help you with diseases, with sicknesses. He helps us with aging. I believe that if we have the ability and we catch the secret of praying in other tongues, we can pray and have a longevity. Are you guys with me? So... Nine, more than 97% of the time, the word infirmities, which is weaknesses, is used for bodily sickness and mental illness. This means if you are a little bit mentally to the left, okay, you, you can, uh, a little bit mentally to the left, you can, you can pray in tongues. And God can do a miracle. I was a mess when I just got saved. But what did I do? Hours I prayed in tongues. Hours. There was times where I prayed through the nights just in tongues. I just kept on praying. Didn't know how to study the word. I just kept on praying in tongues. I thought the Holy Spirit will teach me all things. That's what the Bible is saying. The anointing will teach you all things. So I just prayed in tongues. Then it came to a time when I didn't pray through the nights anymore. But then I prayed through. I prayed just as much as what I could. I was never involved in any social activities until I had to run a youth group. Then I had to do certain things. But even then I called prayer meetings. But I would just pray. And then there came a time even in my own ministry when I started ministry that I would pray sometimes four to seven hours a day in tongues every single day not that I felt I had to but it was the gateway to power I'm going to say it again it was the gateway to power and I knew I was in I was not knowledgeable on a lot of things how would I ever be able to speak to a crowd like this never mind thousands and which we have a lot, trust me. You need a heaven to back you up and to vindicate you. And the only way you can do it is by speaking a heavenly language. And that heavenly language begins to be developed. And as we go into the series, we're going to speak about the, the quality of your language. Because a lot of people have quantity but no quality. They are just making a noise. ba 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 and that's it. They have no quality to their language, which tells me they haven't developed, they haven't spoken their language. They have not engaged with heaven. 
which means they have not become the new man, the kindness man, the new, the new covenant man. They have stayed an old covenant person. No wonder they are under the curse of sickness, death, and poverty. No wonder they leave churches. No wonder they get offended. They are a tree planted and replanted and replanted. And as I said, we grow by transfer growth. Because some people leave here, they go to another church. Others get offended, they come again to this church. Hey, there's a time you need to get stopped getting offended. Jesus says it is, it, is, it is impossible that offense should not come. Yes, it is impossible it should not come. But it doesn't say it's impossible that you should take it. It will come, but do you, will you take it or not? 99% of people that leave is because of offense. I used an example earlier of of uh, email that I just got from somebody that is mature, but it is offense. We know what the situation is. A pity situation. A situation so pity that I am embarrassed that parents can live over a situation like that. Are you guys with me? I don't fear man. Oh, trust me, I don't fear man. I fear God in a man. So if I meet a man of God and I see they have God in them, I can, f I fear God in them. But I don't fear them. I don't fear showmanship. There's a lot of ministers out there that are showmanships. They can do all signs and wonders and lying prophecies. Trust me, lying prophecies. You know, somebody said to me, they found me, they found out some prophets that they followed. It was very, 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 very accurate. They found out they were fake. I said to them, they said, but this, doesn't this discourage you? And doesn't this... I said, this was on a phone call. I said, you know, it doesn't discourage me. It actually encourages me. I said, because what they are faking... I'm actually getting really. So it tells me that I'm hearing from God. Where we thought that this one was so great, but they're faking everything. And they are so great. And here we are, we are actually hearing from God. If we get a name, we get a name. Have I missed it? Many times. I just don't make it sound like I miss it. <laughs> Okay, that is just tricks of the trade. That's not anything, that's just to protect the church and so on. And that doesn't mean we don't know we miss it. Obviously, we do know we miss it. But when I spoke to you about the elections earlier, I'm not missing it. I'm not going to miss it on that one. If I do, I'm infallible. I'm sorry. Then I did. But I'm pretty sure I heard the Lord on that one. Uh, no prophets. Prophets are no longer the exclusive voice of God in the New Testament. So that's why prophecy is only in part, and it's also through fallible men. But when it comes to what I said to you about the elections, I believe that's the word of the Lord. Um, uh, uh, I'm not. I, I don't. I'm not one who likes to give national prophecy, but the Lord has pushed something into me, and then the Lord has shifted something in me um, regarding another realm of ministry. Uh, the last two weeks only, uh, something that I've been obedient to, that I've said no to for many years. Many years, I've said no, 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 and then the Lord said to me. Uh, now it's done. Now you'll see you will have peace doing one, two, three, or peace doing this. And um, uh, it is because I could say no to it. There are other characters out there in ministry. They'll pay a dime. They will pay everything to get certain doors that we have open or even invitations that we have already received, even invitations that we have turned down. They will do everything to get those invitations. Do you know how sneakily it is in ministry? That if I have to, if I reveal a relationship I have publicly, that there are hounds behind us in ministry. You might look up to them. I'm not going to, that's why I won't mention their name. I'm not here to destroy the body or attack the body or discourage your faith. I'm just saying we have hounds that begin to message them. Hey, you know, been thinking about you, praying for you, you know. 
uh, 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 uh. Why? Because uh, Leon got in there. So, you know, let's all jump onto this. That's a ministry for you. That's why the Bible says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Um, ministry is sick when it comes to certain individuals. The talk that I've heard, the things that I've heard, everybody, everybody says we are praying in graves. Please, please, show me the grave that gives me all this power. Uh, uh, that is why we actually stopped moving in prophecy for about a year. And the Lord rebuked me about it and I changed and I'll, and I'll go back. It was because I was threatened by many top ministers in the nation. I'm going to say it again. I was threatened. And uh, because I didn't have anyone around me at the time, I listened to it. And it was a very, very big mistake. The Lord really, the Lord's hand just went like this for my life for about a year. And I had to repent for His hand to come back. Whether they want to call me mystical, whether they want to say I go to rivers, whether they, whatever they want to say, as long as I have his hand upon my life. Not everyone that moves in power moves in pure power. A lot of power is mixture, is tainted. Trust me. Are you guys with me? And then when you find out what people get up to, oh my goodness, then it's a whole nother thing. It'll destroy your faith right there. So let's rather say they are all angels. Um, they are all holy men of God. Um, so, so, so say with me, tongues helps with my sickness. Okay. So tongues, I want to say this, tongues does not edify your spirit. I'm going to say it again. Tongues does not edify your spirit. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 4 and 14. In fact, let me first read 14. It says this. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays. It says my spirit prays. It doesn't say my spirit is edified. Are you guys with me? Let's read verse 4. This is the closest I can get to it. What we have kind of like just made up in our minds. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifies himself. Say himself. Not his spirit. So when you pray in tongues, you edify your whole body. You edify your spirit, your soul, and your body. Are you guys with me? Because we have this phenomenon we, we, we preach to that if we pray in tongues, we edify our spirits. You know, we are, uh, it's, it's, it ben benefits, um, uh, godly exercise benefits much, but physical exercise benefit little. And we think godly exercise is only our spirit. No, no, no. It is your whole body. That when you pray in tongues and you can catch this revelation, even if it's 30 minutes a day, though Paul says, I pray more than you all. Even if it's 30 minutes a day, I believe there will be longevity upon your life. I believe sickness will be less. But you have to do it in a new covenant way and not an old covenant way. There's a way to do it under the law and there's a way to do it in a new covenant. How do you do it in a new covenant? We'll get into that. But it is by knowing that you are right standing with God. You are not praying in tongues to get to right standing. You are praying in tongues because you are in right standing. Simple. You pray because you are a son. You pray because you are a kainos. You don't pray because you want your sins to be forgiven. No, no, no. You pray because your sins are forgiven. Are you guys with me? Do you know, I'll teach on it one day. We'll make it public to make it go viral. The church has the ability to bind and loose people. Bind and losing the devil is not really so big. It's actually not scriptural, but we do it because of experience it's working. But it is about binding and loosing people. 
The church has been given a lot of authority if that church is a house of God. If you're sitting and you can discern this is a house of God, this is where the presence of the Lord is, and you get involved in this ministry, and you mess up, you sleep with your mother-in-law like the woman, like the man in 1 Corinthians 5, uh, or 2 Corinthians 5, where, but 1 Corinthians 5, where he uh, slept with his mother-in-law, and, he, uh, and the church put him out and handed him over to Satan. Then Paul made a very powerful statement in the second letter. He said these words, let's forgive that one, meaning the church kept forgiveness from him. Because I was looking for a verse to collaborate, John 20 verse 23, put it on, to corroborate, 20 23, to interpret. Because you have to use scripture to interpret scripture. And I had one verse, and I preached it, but I'm like, Lord, I need another verse that can corroborate this. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. Let's go New King James Version. So if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. Does it say if Jesus forgive the sins? Does it say if you forgive the sins? Ah. Of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. And I said, God, I need another interpretive scripture. I need another verse with this thing. Because I've been preaching, oh, we can choose not to forgive someone's sins. And as good we can according to the body because we are the body of Christ. We are Christ, not I am Christ. Are you guys with me? The church is very powerful. Actually, the fivefold giftings is parts and extensions of Christ. So we'll leave that one. That's why it's called the extension gifts of Christ. Um, but then I said, give me another verse. And he said, well, the church had to forgive the man to come back into fellowship because he was he was repentant now. And he got so messed up out there, he was handed over to Satan. And Satan ran a mock to him until he repented. Then the church can say, we forgive you. And when the church say, we forgive you, it is like God saying, I forgive you. It is not in relation to salvation but it's in relation to fellowship. That's why it is the local church is very, very serious, very dangerous, very serious. And this thing in South Africa where people just move, 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 move. It's just, it's just never made sense to me because the church is the most powerful entity in this nation if they can understand their authority. I said to somebody the other day, somebody that left, I said, the one that I had an opportunity to talk to, because most don't give us an opportunity to talk to them. So obviously you first try to help them. But I said, do you know that you're gonna stay offended out there? You're gonna stay bitter? until you come and make right. They didn't want to hear it, but I had to say it, because that's the truth. Um, you don't just leave your parents' house without a blessing, cursing them, making trouble, and think your life will be blessed. It doesn't work like that. Are you guys with me? So tongues does not edify your spirit. It edifies your whole body. Say whole body. In fact, in the Greek, it means oikodomo, which means to build a house and edifice, which is a skyscraper, a strong building. So it says you can build God's building where he lives in. So the more you pray in tongues, the more you're building the building, the house that God would live in, meaning the more comfortable you're making it for the Lord to live inside of you, the greater you can live to carry power. Are you guys with me? The Bible says, do you not know that you are the temple, certainly the temple of the Holy Spirit, whom you have from God, and you are not your own. You have been purchased with a price. So he who speaks in a tongue does not, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. Oikodomo builds his own house. Spirit, 
soul and body up. Are you guys with me? So the more you pray in the Spirit, you will release rivers of living water. Every dead thing in your life will begin to get life. The word edify, and I'm just going to get a little bit into it. It means this. It is oikodoma, as we just say, but it means oikos, which means to build, and dom, which means house. That's where we get the word dome from. So you have oikos, to build a house, but to build the house of God, to build the house. So when you pray, you're building the house where God is living, your spirit, your soul, and your body. You're building up your entire house. Are you guys with me? So, so listen, the reason why you don't pray in tongues and why people don't pray in tongues tongues is because of a deceptive thought of the devil and I explained right now I'll get into what that thought is one is laziness second is people don't really want to change I hope that our teachings and our preachings at least stir people up at least I can say for all everybody that thinks only reason people come to this church is because of prophecy when last have we prophesied here? I prophesy when the Lord speaks. That's it. I can go prophesy on everyone if I want to. But I want to give you the word. And uh, giving the word is, you know, if the house is packed, just by the teaching and the word, it should say something. So, so, so we are, you know, we are not begging people to come to church. We are giving the word. So the word will build you up. It's not, you're not here because of prophecy. Prophecy is a dessert. You are not here because of healing and signs, wonders and miracles. Those are desserts. You're here for the word. If I can tell you one thing I am full of, I am full of the word. I can talk to you now till tonight on the word. Trust me. I can open up every verse. We can get into Revelation. I can speak the Word late, many hours, 10 hours. I can sit and preach the Word without preparation. I don't need no notes. I just need a Bible. Just give me a Bible. And I'll sit and preach for you for 10, 10 hours. Revelation upon revelation upon revelation. So get into a place where there's the Word. There's a lot of places where there's shows, 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 and where they conjure God up, but it's not God. I won't say who it is because it might be a friend of mine. But they conjure God up. Oh, we're going to get him into this place now. And they conjure God. No. He is in you. Is there a place for intercessory prayer? Yes, but He is in you. He's not going to move because of your five-minute conjuring up a prayer. You must know how to release Him. And when you have a personal prayer life, praying in other tongues, it'll be like rivers of living water that'll flow through your belly. It'll just flow. It'll come out automatically. It'll be an ease to live in the glory of God. Are you guys with me? So the reason why people don't pray in tongues is because the, the, the devil has put a religious deceptive thought in their head. So I want us to get into the day of Pentecost, but I'm going to go quick through this. So you have many feasts. you got about seven feasts. you got the Passover feast. You have the feast of unleavened bread. It's not very important right now. You have the feast of first fruits. Um, that's one category. Then 50 days after the first fruit feast, you have the feast of Pentecost. I'm speaking now of the Old Covenant. Then you have the feast of... Um, which is also known as the Feast of Weeks. But then you have the Feast of Trumpets, yeah, you have, which is Rosh Hashanah. You have the Feast of Tabernacles. And then in the Feast of Tabernacles, you have the Day of Atonement. But you don't have to, uh, uh, you don't have to worry about that. But there's seven feasts. So three, three. And in the middle, you have Pentecost. Are you guys with me? The Feast of Weeks, which is the Old Covenant one. So you have an Old Pentecost and you have a New Pentecost. And I'll explain that right now. But when we get to Passover, as many of you know, when the blood was put on the doorposts, 
the Bible records that all went out the next morning, around three million people. And this is what the scripture says. It says, not one being sick. They were all renewed and strengthened. So I will still preach a message on communion in a very proper way to say how it does bring healing. But you must mix communion with tongues. If you don't put communion and tongues into context, because communion speaks of His death, tongues speaks of His resurrection. And then you cannot remove the tithe out of it either. That is what we call the three court, the three court, uh, uh, the three court string. Okay, the uh, the three court, huh? Three fold court, the three fold court. Uh, that's what you call the three fold court, which is communion, in my aspect, tithing and tongues, because it's speaking of his death and his resurrection, and then his forever living, as our intercessor. Are you guys with me? So listen. So if under the new covenant, not one was sick and they were all renewed and strengthened, under a new covenant, we have a better blood and a better lamb. Meaning we have the substance where they had the shadow. The old covenant is the type and shadow of things to come. We are the things to come. We are the substance. I don't know if you guys are with me. Are you guys with me? So, 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 so we see in Israel that in the Old Covenant they had the f- different feasts. They got the first of Passover, that was first. Then they had the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that was second. Then they had the Feast of First Fruit, that was the third one. But directly after the Feast of First Fruits, which speaks of the resurrection, are you guys with me? The resurrection was the first fruit. He was the first to be resurrected so that all of us can be resurrected. 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits, we see Moses splitting the Red Sea. Then 50 days from there, they find themselves at Mount Sinai. 50 days after the resurrection, they found themselves in an upper room in Acts chapter number 2, verse 2 in the New Testament. So you have the first Pentecost, which was at Mount Sinai, where fire came down, but the people ran away from the mountain and they were scared to touch the fire. Under the new covenant, there's a new Pentecost, which is at Mount Zion, where the fire came down, sitting upon each head, and they were able to touch it, and it were able to go into their mouths. So you see the old covenant and the new covenant. Are you guys with me? In the first Pentecost, God gave the Ten Commandments, which is the law. In the new Pentecost, under the new covenant, God gave the Spirit written upon our hearts. So as they had to keep the law in the old covenant, now we have to follow the Spirit. I'm going to say it again. The Israelite kept the law. In the Old Covenant, remember the Bible says meditate on the law. It's actually not the word. I know we like to say it's the word, but they were speaking about the law. Are you guys with me? Statutes. Meditate in the law day and night. And you shall be strong. And then it says that none shall miscarry. They would live a full life on this earth, not missing out one bit. And we see the Abrahamic blessing when they would fulfill the law, when they would obey the law. Are you guys with me? You don't have to, don't let any preacher tell you nonsense. And this is Leon de Priya verified. Or Leon de Priya approves of this message. Okay. The Holy Spirit approves of this message. Don't let any preacher tell you you have to obey. We'll get into context, don't worry. So one stupid video someone made, three requirements for salvation. Although this is interesting. First one, accept Jesus Christ. Good, I can take that one. Second one, what was it? 
obey the commandments, the word, something like that. I said, okay. What about those in Africa that doesn't have the word? But anyway, third one. Um, be led by the Spirit. I said, dear Lord, none of us is going to heaven. <laughs> it's saved. I confronted the person that didn't do anything about it. I said, ah, it's up. Why don't you delete it? You're deceiving people. You're saying there are three requirements for salvation. You're moving past sola fide, which is faith only. There's one requirement to be saved. It's faith only. By faith only, you are saved. Believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is it. There's nothing you have to done. He has done it for you. He has obeyed the law for you. He has fulfilled the law for you. Are you guys with me? It is simple. But these Judaizers, butchers and Pharisees want to come and make a difficult gospel. God, Paul called them a ghost. He called it bad news, not good news. Not the Hegelion, which is good news, too good to be true news. But they came with a bad news and he said, even if an angel of heaven comes to you with another gospel, heteros and, uh, heteros and, 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 and alos, this is heteros, another gospel from another kind, not from the same kind. So you have another gospel from the same kind. Many of you yet have gospels, but it's from the same kind. But he says, if any other comes with another gospel of another kind, let him be accursed. Meaning, if they come with another, which means bad news, not good news. If they preach to you bad news, you must know you're sitting under the ministry of Moses, of the old covenant. And the result of those words coming into your ears is going to be nothing but death. And it's going to put a veil over your eyes. That is why since you are in encounter, that veil has been removed, trust me. I can sit in front of a church of 5,000 and they have veils upon them because Moses has been preached to them. The law has been preached to them. We are no longer under the law. Where you preach grace and the Spirit, life comes to people. If the veil is removed. Are you guys with me? Many of those churches preach Moses because they're preaching a thing they don't really have. The Bible says that Moses put a veil on his face because he didn't want to see, may let the people see that the glory is actually fading away. So many of these churches are preaching the law because actually it's Ichabod. Are you guys with me? So the new Pentecost gave the Spirit, the old Pentecost gave the law. So the Spirit for the believer today is what the law was for the Israelite then. If there, so I went through this. If they kept the law, God would bless everything about them in the Old Testament. They would be blessed going in and blessed going out if they kept the law. The law was for them to keep. The Spirit is for us to follow. Rather follow a person than keep an impersonal law. Are you guys with me? The Holy Spirit has replaced the law. The Holy Spirit is far superior than the law. What has this to do with tongues? A lot. Okay. When God gave the law at the foot of the mountain, people were worshiping a golden calf. Listen to this. Moses gave the Levites a sword, the sword of the Levi. And he said, kill all of those who are worshiping the calf. And 3,000 people died under the law. This was the first Pentecost. Under the second Pentecost, the new Pentecost, Peter stood up, preached, and 3,000 people got saved. So under the law, 3,000 died. Under the new, under the Pentecost, under the new covenant, 3,000 lived. Meaning the law kills, but the Spirit gives 
life. Are you guys with me? Wherever the law is, there's condemnation, condemnation, condemnation. Why do you think I say no to many invites, many in this nation? Because it's law being preached to them. So I'm going to come in there as a prophet, I'm just going to get angry. Because they have veils over their eyes and their faces. There's a new gospel. There is a new doctrine that is coming into the body of Christ that I've prophesied. I know people are so upset because I'm eating their golden little cows. I don't care. The Lord told me a new doctrine is coming in. And this is going to be one that is going to be grace and power that is going to come in. That is why we're having the conference uh, that we are having. And it's going, to be, it's going to be very big. You don't want to miss that one. It's going to be very big. And, uh, and also, for some reason, they chose to remove us from the TV show, which is very good. So we were supposed to be on... Um, <laughs> We were supposed to be on Wednesday. Then I saw they postponed it to Thursday, and I saw it going on Thursday. And I saw they only did two church, three churches except us. And um, and then we got an email the next day to say no, they uh, excluded us. I thought that's that's great. I know why they did. I know why they did, because we don't have a scandal. I am not saying that the scandals of the others are wrong. Okay, there can be scandals that the world can just really come after you for doing good. So I'm not saying, and I don't believe, if you have watched that show, please don't believe anything they say. They would have made us look just as evil, if not worse. I don't believe any of that nonsense. One or two victims there, please. I know what happened. They probably got one victim by us. They realized, okay, this is a crazy person. And then, uh, then, uh, 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 you know, then, um, then they realize there's not a scandal. There is some yes, say there are some things. I don't know why. If it was God, I prayed against it. I don't. I didn't really care if we were on. We were going to be on. It didn't really do much for me. I didn't think it was going to do even any damage to the church. I didn't think it was going to affect anyone. Um, I know much more is going to come because I mean we had four TV shows contacting us, to which I all turned down. So um, it is going to keep coming and keep coming and keep coming. The more you do for the Lord, the more these things happen. Um, uh, 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 but. Um, yeah, they didn't go ahead. So that is, that is great. That is great. That's why I said to you, I have full peace. I'm not losing a night of sleep over it and stuff like that. Because, maybe because, because it wasn't there. But um, they were quite adamant. I mean, they sent us questions. We had to answer the questions, all that stuff. And uh, they were very, very, very adamant, very threatening. You know, um, let's get back to tongues. Let's get back to tongues. Let me see. I want to be finished. I want to see what I can skip, what I can't skip. You see, a lot of times we pray and we, we have a situation. We run to people. We run to this pastor, this prophet. We say, please pray for me. While you have one that can pray much better, he is the Holy Spirit. You know, I had recently a, a situation sorted. I struggled, struggled, struggled for very, very, very long and I thought, you know what, let me just pray. I'm just going to lie in my bed, pray a little bit in tongues for like five minutes, just praying in tongues. And I said, Lord, I said, just help me with this one thing. I said, what do I do? I said, do, fix it for me, you know. And um, my staff must be careful because I also many times pray, remove immediately who needs to be removed. I do that because it's his business. And I do that, I do that, I do that really often. So there I prayed, I said, I have a situation with this really. Um, and within a week it was sorted. Within a, within a week, um, a situation came up uh, and it was sorted immediately. Um, something that I couldn't solve, couldn't get the answer to. 
and we were tr- I was trying my best here, trying my best there, trying my best there, trying my best there. But when I came to just praying in tongues, then asking the Lord to help me, and that's it, I just left it there. Within a week it was sorted. Uh, supernaturally, by the way. And later on, I'll expound, expound a little bit on it. But um, you see, I want to explain to you something. In, 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 in the Pentecost conference, in the Pentecost uh, a feast, in the Old Covenant, in the old one, the old Pentecost feast, they used to have unleavened bread. Unleavened bread. And uh, unleavened bread was usually for the Jews. It speaks of Jews. So when you had leavened bread, it spoke of Gentiles. So they were using unleavened bread. Uh, Leaven was a picture of evil. It was a picture of uh, Gentiles. It was a picture of you shouldn't be touching it. And, uh, but as we see it going into the New, New Testament, going into the New Pentecost, we see that, uh, 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 that, that the bread began to change and they were supposed to use leavened bread, not unleavened bread. And we see how God includes both the Jew and the, sorry, he told him to use both leavened and unleavened, meaning that he includes both the Jew and the Gentile in the outpouring of the Spirit. And then we see how the, God only encouraged the leaven to grow once the fire touched it. So that's why the fire was poured out and it caused Gentiles that were even evil in their hearts and you were of a, of a reprobate mind began to grow. So, so you might not be perfect, but in God's eyes you are righteous. Are you guys with me? To be righteous means to be in right standing. I'll get there just now. I'm not going to get through the whole message. I'm just jumping parts and see what I can do, what I cannot do. Let me just explain this. That, that when the Bible says we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself makes intercessions on our behalf, and it says with groanings that cannot even be uttered. And when we look at that word groanings, we think it is falling on the floor and making those weird sounds, and that's not what groanings means. Groanings that cannot be uttered simply means this, a language that cannot be understood because it's from another world. That's what it means. So when it says that the Spirit prays through us even groanings that cannot be uttered, it is a language that cannot be understood. It is tongues. So a lot of people get into this weird and funny things. No, it is simply tongues. It is a deep intercession of tongues, but it is tongues. It is praying in tongues. So you can pray in tongues. But then the Spirit can put an unction on you and you can get deeper and you can get deeper and you can get deeper. But it is a language that is not understood. Are you guys with me? So this is when you get into the difference between classical Greek and, 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 and modern Greek and so on. But uh, 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 let me give you an example. So when Paul spoke about the judgment seat, a lot of people read it out of the modern Greek and they, re- and they don't see it as the Bema seat, as a place to receive rewards. They see it as a place receiving judgment. But when you look at the classical Greek, which Paul originally wrote it in, it is a Bema seat, which is a place to receive rewards. No judgment. So we misunderstand reading the Bible, which means that obviously your sins are forgiven past, present, and future. Are you guys with me? Because there is a a seat of rewards that is going to get out. Listen to me. You are so clean by the blood of Jesus that the Holy Spirit decided to dwell in you. He can only dwell in a clean vessel. If you were not clean, He couldn't dwell in you. So if He is in you, it means you are clean. I'm going to say it again. If He is in you, it means you are clean. Because he cannot, according to the old covenant, which is a type and a shadow, it was first the blood, then the Holy Ghost. Our problem is here, not here. We condemn ourselves up here and we think we are not clean. And because we think we are not clean, we are not clean. But according to our fellowship with God, but the Holy Ghost is still in us. But now it blocks our fellowship with God because of the way that we are thinking. So it's wrong believing, wrong living. 
So guess what? I cannot come to my room. I cannot worship God freely. I cannot talk to Him with no conviction, no guilt, no regret. I cannot come to church to worship Him. Why? Because I am condemning myself and I think I'm not clean. Peter had a vision on the rooftop and the Lord showed him a sheet with animals and it was all animals that were unclean that they were not allowed to eat as Jews and he said now they are clean you can eat them meaning now I have cleansed the Gentiles they can be are you guys with me so never let the devil lie to you to say that you are unclean or you're not good enough. No, no, no. You have been cleansed, cleaned by the blood of righteousness, by the blood of Jesus Christ. So, so, so you're cleaner than Elijah. You see, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. Say in you. But in the Old Testament, He only dwelt upon individuals, never in them. Which means you're cleaner than Elijah, cleaner than David, cleaner than John the Baptist, cleaner than Moses. Because with them, He dwelt upon. With you, He made you His home. He made you His house. Are you guys with me? Mm -hmm. I'm going to jump a few things. That's fine. I want to, I want to, let's see if we can get to this and close with this. Leviticus 23 verse 16. It is quite a bit actually, but. Uh, Leviticus 23 verse 16. Even unto, and put in the New King James for me for this one. Count 50 days. Leviticus 23 16. Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall offer a new grain offering. Say with me, new grain. It's very peculiar that God would use the word new grain because He has never used it before. He would always use grain offering. There would be a grain offering that's different to other offerings. But a new grain offering to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwelling to two loaves of two tenths of enop. They shall be on the fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits to the Lord. They are the first fruits to the Lord. A grain offering is not an animal sacrifice. There was no blood. It was a flower offering. Are you guys with me? I know it's too much for notes. Just catch the spirit of what I'm saying. It was a giving offering. It was a flower offering. New grain was a shadow of new tongues that is going to come. So God is saying, I want a new grain offering. So whenever you speak in tongues, it is an offering unto the Lord. Let's go to verse 18. And you shall offer with the bread seven lambs of the first year. So the seven of the first year without blemish, one young bull and two rams. They shall be as a burnt offering to the Lord with a grain offering and their drink offerings, an offering made by fire for a sweet aroma to the Lord. So the, a burnt offering. This is also very important. So they offered seven lambs, one bull and two rams. So with me, ten. So they offered ten burnt offerings. On the day of Pentecost, God gave ten commandments. In the new Pentecost, God is saying, all I want is sacrifices of praise from your mouth which is a grain offering and a burnt offering together. Meaning God considers the sacrifices of your lips. But let's go deeper. Hosea 14 verse 2. Hosea 14 verse 2. Put in the King James Version. Hosea 14 verse 2. Take with you words and turn to the Lord. Take with you words. Say take with you words. And turn to the Lord. Say unto Him. Take away all my iniquity and receive us graciously. So will we render the calves, say the calves of our lips. This is very important. The calves of our lips. God took away our iniquity with the Lord Jesus Christ. 
with his death and his resurrection. He received us graciously. We understand all these things. Calves here, the calves of our lips, speaks of a young bull. Meaning we now render the praises of our lips as a sacrifice. We no longer require that sin offering. It is now a burnt offering. Sin offering was required in the Old Testament when you sinned. A burnt offering is something that was a sweet aroma. It was an offering of appreciation and thanksgiving. It is a worship offering. Are you guys with me? So when you pray in tongues, you're praising God continuously. When you allow the Holy Spirit to be loosed on the inside of you, your prayers will always be answered because He is always working on it. When He prays on your behalf, He is always working on it. What happens when we pray? The Holy Spirit prays on our behalf. Are you guys with me? When you pray in tongues, you pray and you cause a peace to come upon you, knowing your prayers are taken care of. So what happens when you pray in tongues? When I pray in tongues, I know whatever I am praying, the Holy Spirit is praying something. A situation that might be happening 10 years from now or right now or a month from now. And I can have peace. Why? He is the perfect intercessor. He is the perfect intercessor. So I have peace. The Holy Spirit is a paraclete. Meaning he comes alongside of as a helper, a counselor, and an advocate. He's an advocate that doesn't fail. A lawyer that doesn't lose a case. Meaning that when you pray in other tongues, you cannot lose a case. He is the best advocate. Then you have Jesus as the best advocate. Then you have the Father as the best judge. Are you guys with me? He is the one that fights for you. If you struggle with debt, Jesus paid all your debts. So when you pray in tongues, you are advocating and you are applying what has already been done, the finished work of the cross. 1 Corinthians 8, 9. 1 Corinthians 8, 9. I'm sorry it's going a bit longer today. It's okay. You're not here tonight. 1 Corinthians 8, 9. But to take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. No, 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 no. Is this 1 Corinthians? I put in the New King James for me. No, I think I've got the wrong one here. Maybe it is... Um, maybe it is 2 Corinthians. Let's try 2 Corinthians. Maybe I wrote the wrong verse. It's fine. I'll get it now. Let's try 2 Corinthians. Is there no 2 Corinthians? Maybe this. Yeah, it's this one. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor. For your sake, that you through his poverty might become rich. Did it say wholesome? Okay. Did it say rich? Okay. Simple. There's benefits in the cross that we haven't tapped into. Meaning that you have a right to this blessing. You are the righteous, so the righteousness of God. Righteousness, the first part is right. Righteousness. Meaning it is your right to get the blessing that Jesus paid for. You don't have to earn that blessing. It is your right. It is not even a privilege. It is your right. You cannot earn something that has already been paid for. And you cannot pay for something that has already been paid for. Sick, meaning healing, is your right, not your privilege. Blessing is your right. Why? He died for it upon the cross. It is not your privilege. It is your right. He legally created a new covenant for you and I. Where if those documents are in front of a great judge, it is your right, 
not privilege. Are you guys with me? Whatever Jesus accomplished for you has been given to you as your right. The problem is that we are not living in the rights that we have. We are living short of it. Many of us settle for a lower life. The devil loses it when you settle for it and not fight for it. Or oh, sorry, the devil loves it when you settle for a lower life and you lose what God has for you and you're not taking what you're supposed to be having. He loves it when you're just settling. Just settling. The thing that will bridge the gap of settling or living the fullness that God has for you is praying in other tongues. Let's go Hosea 14 verse 2 again, but in the Amplified C version. Hosea 14 verse 2 in the Amplified C version. <laughs> Listen to this. Take with your words and return to the Lord. Say to Him, take away all our iniquity. Accept what is good and receive us graciously. So will we render our thanks, say with me, our thanks, as bullocks to be sacrificed and pay the confession of our lips. So what it's saying is saying the bullocks of our lips, the calves, remember it says the calves of our lips, which means the bullocks of our lips. So we render to Him the bullocks that usually are sacrificed of our lips. So He's saying, that's why I receive the praying in tongues, the new grain offering, the burnt offering that comes up like a burnt offering before the Lord. That is why there was a cloven tongues of fire upon the heads of each one. It was a burnt offering. I'll get into cloven just now. Are you guys with me? So what is the big deal of burnt offerings? Listen to this. Let me say cloven. Say with me cloven. You know, Acts chapter number 2 says, cloven tongues of fire. Yes. Have you ever thought, why cloven? Let me explain to you something. So the cloven tongues of fire. Yes. Put it up, put it up. Acts chapter number 2 somewhere in King James most definitely. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues. Now in the upper room were only Jews. Jews were not allowed to eat any animal with a cloven foot. Are you guys with me? And God says, I'm pouring out a fire, a cloven tongues of fire. Meaning in this fire, I am including the Gentiles. There's no racism. There's no this, there's no that. I'm giving you something that used to be unclean, but is now clean. And I'm putting it upon your head. And it is a new why. The old contract and the old covenant is done away with. And there's a new covenant and a new contract that has come in. It is the cloven tongues of fire that is for each of you. So what did it do? It fought every mindset of a Jew in that place. Because what did they see? When they saw fire on their heads, they saw it like a clove of an animal on their heads. Are you guys with me? Are you with me? So why burnt offering? When Solomon offered a burnt offering in the Old Testament, a thousand burnt offerings, that same night God appeared to him in a dream and said to him, Solomon, Tell me what you want. Whatever you want, I will give it to you. God appeared to those who gives burnt offerings. Now we've established what is a burnt offering. It is the fire cloven tongues of fire. 
upon your head. When I pray in tongues and I give calves of my lips as burnt offerings unto the Lord. When I pray in tongues, meaning that when you pray in tongues and like Solomon giving a thousand burnt offerings is a type and a shadow of somebody that has a prayer life of tongues like Paul who says, I pray in other tongues more than you all. Meaning that when you pray, nothing is impossible. God will come to you and say to you, whatever you want, I will give it to you. But what is the gap? What is the secret? Say with me, praying in tongues. That is it. But how many of us are really, truly, honestly doing it? We can say every day we are lavroska, avreska, deneska, daeska, daya, leska, avloska, lebreska, enelevska, daya, braska, alev. Every day, every day, every day, wherever we are. And then there's secret moments where we're praying more intensely and we get into groanings and we're praying more intercessorily wise and we, or, or more deeper. Lavroska, anamans, neska, daya. And there's a quality to our tongues, not just a quantity, but there's a quality, meaning we have an actual relation and an Inter uh, uh, interaction and there's an altar at our house, an altar where power carries. Listen, where I'm standing here is an altar of power. What is happening here? There's a transaction between heaven and earth right here. That is why when I stand here, an unction comes upon me. It doesn't matter. It meaning there's a communication between heaven and earth. There's an unction between heaven and earth. So when you pray in tongues, you build an altar. When you pray in tongues, nothing is impossible. When you pray in tongues, God comes to you with a blank check and say whatever you want, it is yours. Tongues is a must under the new covenant as the law was a must under the old covenant. I don't know if you, if you hear what I'm saying. Are you guys with me? Let me get to the last point. So keep, so if we keep the Spirit in my mouth. Remember what he said to Joshua in the Old Testament. He says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. And in it you shall have good success. And you will make your way prosperous. In the new covenant... The Spirit shall not depart from your mouth. And in this you shall have good success and make your way prosperous. That's why Paul says, I pray in tongues more than you all. Does the word make sense to you? Let's, let's get a little bit deeper. Leviticus 23 verse 21. Leviticus 23 verse 21. Baruch HaKeviskete Kena Mambreskete. Those on Facebook and on YouTube, if you like it, give us the number five right now. And do me a favor again on YouTube, press the thumbs up button, press the like button for me quickly. I can see right here as you do it. Press the thumbs up, press the like button. And uh, uh, it just helps us get out. Give us a number five. Tell us also the country you're watching from. It helps us. We have people watching from all over the world. All over the world. We want to go to the Netherlands now. We have partners in the Netherlands. We want to go to Croatia. We have partners in Croatia. We have partners in Romania. We have partners everywhere. And we are just starting. Leviticus 23 verse 21, New King James Version. And you shall proclaim on the self, on the same day, that is a holy convocation. So a holy convocation. It is a holiday. Okay? You shall do no customary work on it, meaning you shall rest. It shall be a statute forever, say forever, in all your dwellings throughout your generation. So the feast was seen as a holy day, a holiday. A holiday. On holidays you don't work. On holidays you rest. It is a picture of rest. Go Isaiah 28 verse 11. Isaiah 28 verse 11. Listen to this. 
for with stammering lips and another tongue, say with me another tongue, and we can get with this eteroso at alosun, so on, but another tongue, he will speak to, his, to, his, to this people, to whom he said, this is the rest. Say with me, this is the rest. What is the rest? The other tongue. This is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. Yet they would not hear. God is saying that this is the rest and the refreshing. Like we would say, you have R&R, &R, rest and recreation. But there's a rest and refreshing for a believer. It is when you, when you depart and you go into a solitary place and you begin to pray in other tongues. What is happening? It's rest and refreshing that is constantly coming upon you. The word rest in the Hebrew, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's hamanunu or something like that, okay? It's not necessary to pronounce it. Actually, it's kamenunu, something like that. But I'm not going to open up my programs now for the sake of time. But it is the same saying that is this in Psalm 23 verse 1. Put in Psalm 23 verse 1. It is the same saying as this. That the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides the hamenomenu, whatever that is, rest. Still waters. So if he still waters. So how does he still your soul? By praying in other tongues. So if he new covenants. So it is a peace. It is a rest. It is the same word God used to say to the Israelites when He said to them, I'll bring you into the land of milk and honey. A place where you do not have to dig wells or build houses that you never had to build. But the people never believed Him. Listen to me. There is a realm that you can enter into. When you pray in other tongues appropriately, with faith, receiving, you will build how you will have houses you have never built. You will have lands you have never worked for. You will have wells you have never dug. I don't know if you hear what I'm saying. You will have vineyards you have never grown. Listen to me. This is one thing I believed. I sought first the kingdom of God and then His righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto me. Everybody said I was foolish. But one thing I put ahead of myself was the Lord and His kingdom. And I began to pray. I began to worship. Not one month or two months. Years and years and years and years. And God has brought my dreams to pass one after the other after the other. It is not a skill or ability. He has given you a new covenant. It is time to apply the laws of the new covenant. The clauses, your rights of the new covenant. Are you guys with me? There is a new covenant that is available. Pray in tongues for an hour or two every day. In two months, you will be a different person. Jobs will open for you. Relationships, correct relationships will come to you. Refreshing and rest will come to you. I don't care if you live in a shack. Or if you live in a palace. I lived on the streets. Not yet in a palace. Almost. I will have one. Okay. I, I heard they're going for cheap in Scotland. Okay. So. So if you rest. So God said to the Israelites, because you didn't believe me, you will not enter my rest. But now we see it being quoted in the Greek in the New Testament. Go through to Hebrews 4 verse 3. So it's no longer the word hamunumunumu, however you say it. It's no longer that word. It is now changed to, to this saying. For we have to believe to believe to enter that rest, as he has said. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And then it goes on in Hebrews, it, it goes on, it says, let us labor in verse 11. Let us labor 
therefore to enter into the rest. So it has changed from just rest to let us labor to enter that rest. Now it's an oxymoron because it's saying in one say, word, it's saying you must work. In another word, it's saying to rest. So it confuses the mind because we confuse what work is and what rest is. Are you guys with me? Labor is not rest and rest is not labor. But you labor to enter this rest by praying in the Spirit. So the labor is receiving what God has already done. His rest, when He laid His head down at the cross at the rest. The Bible says He laid His head down to rest. He entered His rest. We entered His rest. The wrath of God was removed. But now we must also enter into it positionally on this earth. Into the land of milk and honey. There's a promised land for you. How do you do it? By laboring. Laboring how? Praying in other tongues. Like the Apostle Paul says, I labor more than you all. Yet by the grace of God. I do it by grace, but I labor more than you all. Okay, but Paul, are you now under law? Are you under legalism? Are you under works? No, no, no. There's a way I labor. And then he says, I pray in tongues more than you all. Are you guys with me? So you labor into his rest by praying in the Spirit. Tongues is not a work, although it is called labor, it is a rest. There's a difference between labor and toil. A big difference. Tongues is not toil. Legalism is toil. It is a rest. When you experience true Pentecost, you will experience true rest. A lot of Christians don't have peace and rest in their souls. They don't have. Their mind is full of chaos, anxieties, fears, gossips, grandmother's old woman fables. If you're an old woman fable year, oh yes, down the road. Pepeco probably somewhere, I'm not sure. They anyway don't like me. I might as well say it on a live stream. <laughs> Apparently one of them, one of them too, swore at us, phoned our secretary and swore at us. On the first day we opened or something like that. Who the peep, 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 peep does? Leon think he is peep, da, da, da. And uh, you should first be taking me for coffee. I'm like, wash your mouth with soap, brother. I don't care who you are. I'm not going to mention his name because I do honor ministers, so I don't never mention names. <laughs> Just mentioning the situation for it if he listens. And if he listens, why are you listening? So Acts, they almost finish. Acts 2 verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, so with me, suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. Meaning that the very first people that got saved were the people in the upper room. It was 120 of them that got saved. God had to hurry up because the Holy Spirit had to be poured out. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire and it sat upon each of them. Now I explain to you what the cloven means. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Verse 4. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. As the Spirit gave them utterance. The first thing that God did for people after Christ was to fill them with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Meaning this is a very important point. That is why the devil is attacking this point and he's saying to people, he's lying to them and he's saying this, he's saying, listen, when you pray in other tongues, you are doing a work and you are in legalism and you are not under grace. So when you're at home and you're praying and you're praying, you know, Prophet Leon is saying, grace, grace, grace. Why are you working? Why are you in legalism? No, no, no. Praying in tongues is the new New covenant language it is not a work it is not legalism I don't know if you hear what I'm saying it is not work it is not legalism 
It is the rest actually. It is when you pray in tongues, you receive a rest and a refreshing. So the key to walking in the new covenant is the Holy Spirit. Are you guys with me? So, so, so stand your feet, stand your feet, stand your feet. So we see in Exodus chapter number 32 how 3,000 men fell and die that day. That was um, that was when Moses with the mountain and so on. The 3,000 men died at the old Pentecost. This was the first Pentecost. Moses was coming down mountain with two tablets. He came down. He saw everybody was naked. Three million or however many of them there. They were having orgies, worshipping a uh, golden calf, having all kinds of parties. And he commanded by the sword of Levi that 3,000 of them will die by the sword. This was the first Pentecost under the law, another covenant. You want to live by that covenant, go ahead. That is why many die before their time. That is why many don't have longevity. That is why many are sick. And that is why many are poor. Because you live under the old covenant. I think we'll do a teaching on the new covenant. I just, it's going to take a lot of work. In the New Testament, new covenant, 3,000 was saved with a new sword. The sword that doesn't kill, but the sword that gives life. It's the rhema sword of God. It's the only weapon in your armory that is offensive and not defensive. It is the only weapon that is offensive because it is a sword that cuts and kills the enemy by a rhema word. Are you guys with me? The more you pray in tongues, the more you cut off the bondages in your life and the life of others. I always wondered why did demons not scream out of me the way it screams out of some other Christians that's been saved for 30 years, even preachers. And I realized I prayed hours and hours and hours and hours in tongues. Hours and hours and hours. And I didn't just pray for the sake of praying. I prayed into the crevices of my spirit being, of my body, everywhere. I went into the topology of my body. I cast the demons out. I prayed. I let light come in. It wasn't like I wasn't in sin. I wasn't a lot of sin. But I understood grace and I understood the finished work of the cross. And then I understood praying in tongues. And now we have to cast our devils out of people because they don't understand the finished work of the cross. They don't do what they're supposed to be doing under the new covenant. So the devil comes in by law. So because they're not praying in tongues, they are automatically falling under legalism. The devil comes in by legalism. Whenever you have condemnation, you are under legalism. That is how the devil comes in. Are you guys with me? So it's the rhema sword that cuts the devil. So Ephesians 6 verse 17 says, just as you're standing, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the rhema word of God. Verse 18, listen to this. So with him praying always. It doesn't say that in the Greek. It says this. It says this, by means of praying always. So let me read it to you again. Let's go verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the rhema word of God, which is prayer. The way you pick up the sword, he says, by means of praying always with all prayers. So how do you take off the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit? It's rhema. By means of praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Uh, <clears throat> And watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Are you guys with me? So in the English, verse 18 starts with praying. In the Greek, it starts with by means of always. By means of praying always. So praying in the Spirit is praying in tongues. Everything in the armor is for protection and defensive. Only the sword is offensive. So we heal the sword of the Spirit by always, say with you, always, praying in the Spirit. The more you pray in the Spirit, you heal the sword. You cut off bondages of your own life. You cut off bondages of the enemy. You have the ability to dissect situations. You have the, the Bible says the Word of God pierces is like a two-edged sword. Cuts 
uh, uh, bone and marrow, soul and spirit, uh, dis- uh, hearts and thoughts and discern of the thoughts and hearts. But what it is means the Logos. The Logos is also the living word, which is the spirit. It's not a dead word. Only Graphe is dead. Logos is a living word. Rhema is spoken words. Both are done by the Holy Ghost, which is the Holy Spirit, which is praying in other tongues. So the more I pray and speak in other tongues, the more I cut the enemy where it needs to be cut, the more life I bring to myself, the more health I bring to myself, the more longevity I bring to myself, the more I am being changed into a kainos, New covenant man. Come on, are you guys with me? Let's give a praise offering where you are. Come on, praise him. Raise your hands to the Lord. Raise your hands to the Lord. La rosa abrige ke ne meske bere ke reduska breke de le bredo muske. So they say, Holy Spirit, Heavenly Father, today I commit to pray at least 30 minutes of tongues a day. Fill me with longevity, with all the promises. I heard today, make me a praying Christian with fire on my altar. Say it again, with fire on my altar. Let there be power behind my prayers. Let us take this region, West Rands, every area around here, by becoming supernaturally natural in Jesus mighty name we give you all the honor the power and the glory in Jesus name come on let's give him one more praise of the church Amen. Thank you so much. God bless you. If you would like to give into this ministry, we have made giving your tithes, seed, or offering as simple and effortless as possible. You can simply log on to encounterchurch.co.za or leondupria.com and click on the Give button. Here we show you the different ways to give. It's so easy. You will find giving options for local or international giving. PayFast is a fast and secure way for South Africans to give. You can give once off or make a recurring donation. Here you will find the Zapper and SnapScan QR codes as a simple and effortless way to scan and give into the ministry. If you prefer to make an electronic transfer, the banking details of our various campuses and the Visionary Fund are also readily available. For giving internationally, Cash App is one of our fast and simple giving platforms. PayPal is another method for quick and easy giving internationally. You can use your PayPal account or you can give straight from your credit card. DonorBox is also available, which accepts a variety of international giving methods. For those who would like to take hands with us and become a part of the incredible work that God is doing, become a friend and partner of Encounter and Leon Dupria. We have many partnership tiers available to suit your preference. Our friends and partners receive exclusive materials from Leon Dupria, as well as private live streams and exclusive events. Thank you for being part of what God is doing.